So in part one, I described how I started the whole project, like setting up the drums, um, picking the basic level of each and every um, instrument, like the snare, the tom. So I just like getting like starting to to paint the picture uh, first and foremost. In this part two of the series, um, I'm gonna go more detailed and explain why I chose particular instruments um, in the song uh, context of the song. I go to different sections and um, start the more, the more advanced stuff so we can really follow along and look inside my head. I'm gonna do this on the fly. There's nothing prepared, but it, I think it's easier for you to follow along and to see and to understand uh, what I'm gonna do. So let's dive in. So the section is pretty much the same as uh, we ended up. So I put Superior Drama here in the back um, on the right side so I can have easy access to that. Um, I left the channels 1920 up to 3132 open um, because I wanted to allow me to have the option to dial in some of the things. So uh, let's again start with just listening to the song um, like the first um, seconds in case you just missed the first episode and you want to to listen what this is all about. So the song is called The Elephant from an artist called Robert Hammond. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the choice of the snare drum. Of course, um, there's always a little bit um, personal taste going on. So, <sighs> sorry for that. Um, so there's always a little bit of personal taste. But if you remember from the last video, from the first video, I was torn between the Tama Brabras, uh, the Drumcraft Brabras, and the Lagwerk Black Beauty. And I ended up using the Black Beauty. Um, just like the comparison, the three of them, this is like the Tama Brabras the drum craft and the black beauty so the black beauty for me has um, a little bit more warmth and low into it um, it's i mean they're all metal drums so they're all cracky and give a great attack but um, the choice i made is because of the song so when you listen to the guitars and especially those um, the bass line and the rhythm guitars here. Listen on the key of the song and how they play that. So let me just jump here to the section in the verse. Um, so you will hear what I mean. So the, the whole song has a little bit more of a warm and low feeling to it, like more low end oriented. It's not like a bright, open um, um, Tyler Swift song, of course. So I wanted to find something that matches that song. Um, you can, of course, go the exact opposite, saying because the song has this dark feeling to it, I want a kick and a snare that really pops uh, and cuts through the mix and make it more attacky. Um, the same reason I picked that Gretsch kick uh, I was torn between, in the end, between the DW collector, uh, Collector's Maple, which has, due to the characteristics of Maple, has this more uh, um, attacky sound. Um, it's an 18 by 22 in kickham. Um, 
to the 14 by 24 uh, Gretsch kick. So this kick has like the Gretsch kick, which I will stick to. This has more like the typical 14 inch deep. Um, it's shallower, um, like the shell is shallower. 14 inch I personally like and often prefer because the air in the drum hasn't that much space to move. Um, so the, the, the drum, and it's 24, so it's a little bit wider and, and uh, like bigger in diameter. So you get a little bit more low end right off the box. Um, but the, um, the low end for me seems more controlled due to the, um, to the depth of the 14 inch. Uh, 22 by 18 is of course a common kick drum for pop productions. In this song, I feel I don't need, if it wasn't a hard rock song, a metal song, I'd probably go for the DW Collectors. But I like and I dig this more soft attacky thing. I can easily dial in some of the attack with an EQ. But just like from a core perspective, the snare with the warmth body of the Ludwig Beauty and this kick drum, they contribute more to the song. I'm probably going to mix the song in a way that everything is glued together. So I don't want the drums to be processed larger than life. They are... Um, um, an important part of this song, don't get me wrong. Um, it's like an easy beat, but this contributes to the song, to the feeling. Uh, that straight um, backbeat, um, kick drum one and two, one and three, snare drum two and four, uh, along with those um, um, the 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 bass guitar and the and this rhythm guitar. So it's a great arrangement from the song, but that's the reason I chose those particular instruments. And the same for the um, cymbals. If you remember my first video. Um, I started with the minor bisons, but this was a little bit too harsh for me, especially in that open section when the drummer was hitting the open hi-hat all the time. Um, the high frequencies there can a little bit annoying and too aggressive and too harsh, and I saw myself already fighting against that with EQ. So I go for the uh, special dry Zildjian K Custom, 15 inches tend to be a little bit darker anyway, and the special dry is like they have this reduced uh, frequency range. With the symbol as well, uh, the minor bisons, uh, medium thin, a little bit darker than the Zildjian A customs. Zildjian A customs for all the non-drummers out there, they are amazing for when you want cutting through rock and metal symbols. They are probably industry standard kind of like, um, but I knew already minor uh, bisons would probably work better. So that's the reason um, for the kick and snare. But let's talk about the toms right now, because when you remember, um, I'm switching between the toms. And there's a part of uh, in the video here where there's a cool build-up section. I think is here. Let me just check. Quick side note, what I did on the programming, um, you know that I transferred the actual live recorded acoustic drums into Trekker so I can use the MIDI file. Um, I kept the performance uh, as it was. Uh, what I did though, uh, let me open the MIDI section here. So where's this build up section? So here, um, what I did, um, I've added something which is, makes the song more humanizing, which I, how I would play it. Um, so when I go to this, build up section here um, let me just so here we go here is the, the build up section from the toms what I did though here um, I added on every single beat of the bar so on two three four one two three four this pedal closed sound from the hi-hats which sounds like this um, the original play, uh, drummer didn't play that, obviously he was good in time, um, but I as a drummer and a lot of drummers do this um, in the background to, to keep track. If you don't play to a click track, it's a live performance, something like that, usually what you do to keep track, your internal pulse, um, you move the hi-hat with your left foot. Um, and I wanted to add this little neat sound just slightly in the background there you see the velocity is quite low so i used this just to make it a little bit more i don't know human um so let me jump straight into this uh, section here so you can hear the hi-hat so 
So um, sometimes I even program them slightly off uh, the grid, um, so it makes more human, so that that's not too static. But that's just like a side information. So um, I will use the build up section here. It goes from bar 98 to 106. So let me just loop this section here. Um, so we can listen to the tones. So we're going to loop this here. Um, and why I decided to go for the Gretsch uh, um, drums in this case. Uh, the square badge 1980s, uh, they sound like a thunder. Um, I like the combination of low end and attack here. Um, the song is usually driven by kick and snare, but I know, um, and this is what you shake when you when you make a song, like, is there any important part in the song where you need toms? In this case, because it's a build up, the toms really can stand out. They don't have to fight against a wall of guitar or bass uh, because it's really like, so they can really shine. Um, so it's a different approach than picking toms, let's say, when you're just like playing fast fills you, um, um, alongside two guitars. You need more, let's say, attacky toms in that case. But the same for the kick and the snare. I wanted toms that have some fat low end because this build up really kind of like leads the listener to the final chorus when everything gets louder and exploding. So that's the reason. So let's hear again just the toms. Um, and always in context with the song, just to get used to it. It doesn't make sense to listen to toms on, on their own. You need to listen in context with the song. So here's the Gretsch square batch toms in that build-up section. I mean, the snare and the hi-hat, of course, and the final chorus is still unprocessed. Um, I haven't touched any plugins so far. But as I said in the first um, chapter or part of this video series, um, it's really trying to get as close as possible to the sound idea you have in your head um, because it makes life easier when it comes to mixing. But let's quickly compare to the other options. So let's go for the Yamaha Recording Custom. The Recording Custom, again, an information for all you non-drummers out there, Recording Custom are um, famous for a certain reason. They are birch shells. And birch shells are not only there, of course, um, highly built uh, with Japanese uh, perfection, um, but birch shells have that cool effect that they sound kind of like pre eq'd already. They have a nice crack and attack to it. They're sometimes, for me, they're missing a little bit of low end, but that's the purpose of birch. Um, and the Rimaru Recording Customs are probably one of the most, if not the most, um, well known and famous birch shells. Um, and Yamaha claims that those are the most recorded drums in music history. I don't know where they have the numbers from, but um, so let's listen to the Yamaha recording customs here. I like the attack. It's clean, it's clear, but um, as again, they're missing a little bit of low end. Of course, you can always EQ them, but um, so just like for the sake of comparison, uh, the DW Collector's Maple. Uh, the DW Collector's Maple, um, it's an all around great sounding kit, um, highly, highly famous uh, for recording purposes and life. Um, maple shells have this, the perfect balance between low end and attack. So let's listen how they sound. And finally, the Sonor Designer Birch. Um, I, I mean, it's a nine by 10 inch rectum, so it's a little bit too small and too bright. Of course, I could easily switch to the 10 by 12 Sonor Designer Birch here, but just like out of fun, I already know that I don't gonna use them, um, but let's listen to them just one more time. Don't you see, I'm the 
already know during the mixing process um, that I will highlight and make this um, section or this part of the song, this build up, this bridge uh, bigger, larger than life, um, with maybe reverb and some additional compression just for that part. But right now, I think I'm um, I stick to the Gretsch square batch. So um, another thing that I wanted to um, um, check right now here, and which is like more the advanced thing, I told you that I'm gonna leave some channels open just to experiment with the different um, sounds here. I'm pretty happy with this ambience near microphone. It's the, um, uh, the ambience mid here. It's a perfect balance between far and close. So it gives me a li nice lively character. I don't think that I'm gonna use too much reverb on this song in the mixing because though it's a rock song and it like explodes at the end, but it still has this indie flavor to it. Um, so it's probably not going to end like sounding like a Green Day stadium rock thing. So um, for this purpose, uh, let me try the ambience mono here. And just for the sake of doing showing it here, I will just for by now mute the ambience mono so you can really follow along. Um, mono microphones um, have the advantage that they bring the drums more into the center. Sometimes like when the room is too big or you add reverb to it, sometimes you lose the focus of the drums being part of the middle and being like the driving beat um, in the in the center. So mono microphones can help to glue the stuff together because it's obviously coming from the middle. They often sound a little bit darker. So when you compress them a little bit and tweak them a little bit with EQ, you can add a little bit like power and weight to the drums. So uh, I assume they're just called ambience mono one and two here. So I assume they are recorded um, in different positions of the room. So one of them I assume is gonna be closer sounding and the run other one is um, far away. So let me enable both here, solo them and just compare them how they sound. But let's jump to the section where we hear the full beats. Yeah, Ambience Mono 2 is clearly far away, um, but I don't think I need this because I get my ambience already from the uh, stereo microphones. So I won't use the Ambient Mono 2 here, but I'm gonna think um, I'm gonna use send at least where we are, it's 1718, so 1920. I'm gonna send out um, what you can discuss and what I'm gonna probably do because I already have a lot of um, symbol information here. And this is the cool thing about Superior Drummer or a software like that which is of course not possible in the real world, I'm gonna deactivate or disable all the um, symbols um, because I just want the drums or the shells themselves coming through that microphone because I'm gonna probably compress uh, the hell out of this channel or at least quite decently. And what will happen is when you compress room microphones, that have a lot of um, symbol information to them. And I know some of the parts where the crashes are heavily hit. So when you compress them too much, like the symbols can get really annoying and too loud and harsh. And it can be a cool effect, but I don't think I'm gonna use this here. So just gonna send a kick snare and the two toms in this ambience mono microphone. And I'm gonna go to my DAW to track 1920. I'm gonna name this. Um, I'm gonna name this mono drums. So it's not just a room, it's just the mono drums. So let's just listen how that sounds, make sure that it's not this uh, solid anymore. So let me just like do a, bring it up slide a bit. Um, let's see what this makes for a difference here. Having two different options here can really help afterwards. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, the stereo room and the mono room, when you automate the volume, um, especially because this verse part is really 
let's say slower or it's like really intimate and dense um not much stuff going on so probably i'm going to bring up the mono microphone even more and the moment the chorus kicks in i'm going to push the stereo room microphone so it gives this impression that the big uh, the drums get bigger in that particular moment though it's just an automation trick between the tracks so i will keep that uh, next thing let me uh check uh what can be used um the um the symbols here uh, you see the right the chinas and the splash uh, have dedicated microphones and by default just the particular instrument that's named in this channel is closely mic'd so you see here on the right um, channel you see just the right is enabled but you can add all the other stuff and um I'm probably not going to use the right here and the splash. The reason why they do this, especially in a metal um, pack, is that it's you can use for automation reasons. Um, again, we're talking about uh, this uh, this SDX was made for death metal and speed metal and trash metal and all that stuff. So usually a mix where there's really dense stuff going on, and having the control over those symbols and especially in the overheads. Um, symbols can sometimes be swallowed by this wall of sound that's coming in, in that genre. So having dedicated channels allows you to automate the signal into your mix. Um, so if there's a part where you are riding the ride and playing the ride, you can just like bring up that fader without bringing up the old overhead channel um, and make the song or uh, your, your song gets out of balance. But I don't think I'm going to use this here. Uh, what you can use sometimes to glue the drums together, that you group them all together. So in the instance, let's say 21, 22, and just enable, for instance, all the uh, the symbols at once. So you get an kind of like an overall additional picture of the symbols just coming from those supportive microphones. But I don't think I'm going to use this either. So let me hide those channels to clean it up a little bit. Um, I won't use the different uh, overheads as well. So now I, I'm going to stick to the sound. Let me just disable all the channels I don't use. Lastly, um, what sometimes is used, what is a great trick um, to give the toms more, let's say, body and weight. When you, what I do, I enable all the toms and um, I'm going to highlight and enable the bleeding from all the other toms and you might think mike why you do this on rectum one and rectum three and the floor tom two because you don't use them this is right however when you bring all the toms together you can create just like a tom bleeding bus and this will help to bring the toms uh, out a little bit more um, but so just like enabling here on the right side and when you go now through the channel you see on every single microphone uh, the toms, the particular toms are enabled, so you get some bleeding. So let me jump to the uh, section here with the build up and just like soloing the toms here by now, so you will hear what I mean, especially when I um, when I highlight just the toms that are not used uh, right now. So let me, so I have the floor tom and the rec tom used, but let's just um, use the other three and you will hear what I mean. You can even add the kick here. So I'm gonna send, I'm gonna use this just like for the sake, uh, for uh, fun reasons. So, and now we are at uh, channel one, damn it, so. 2122 um and this one as well 2122 rectum one and floor tom two so let's this solo them or unsolo them not sure if i'm going to use this in the mix but now 2122 i call this tom bleed so now I'm going to delete all the rest of the stuff here. So I'll show you what I mean by doing this. Um, 
So we are now listening to the section here uh, where the build-up is happening with the toms and I will slowly bring that channel in to emphasize just that part. I don't think that I'm going to use this um, channel here, Tom Bleeds, the whole song, just for that particular se section. And you see, guys, this is really still, I haven't even touched uh, any plugins still. It's all about preparation. Um, I know this might be a boring topic. People always want to see like five minute videos, how to make a kick drum sound badass. But this is really important that you um, prepare. Pre preparation is everything. What you see the cool guys online, all the Grammy guys, uh, when they do a mixing, they usually have assistants doing exactly that work for them. So they just can at the end do the creative stuff. But this is the truth. Um, when you work on a song, uh, it's all about preparation. Of course, you can do this afterwards, but I'd like to uh, prepare everything and then maybe some hours later or a day later come back to the session and really actually start to mix because I prepared everything and I really can concentrate on the creative part here. Find. I don't mind. I'll be sure to end it soon. So, so they're always getting, uh, almost getting too loud now, but um, it's really just an idea. Um, I'm probably going to EQ them just a little bit, uh, maybe add a slight a bit of reverb. It's just like giving them some depth and some width because it's coming from the different microphones, um, not from the two, war, two microphones from the rack tom and the floor tom, but all the other microphones. And this is the cool thing about technology. You can obviously do this in the real recording because you play the drum set together. Um, so the, those microphones will always capture the snare, the hi-hat and everything else as well. So um, I just take advantage of the cool features that Superior Drama gives me. So having that said, um, adding all those stuff, um, what I'm going to do again right now, I'm going to do uh, making a balance decision here. So I'm going to start with the song uh, again from start. Now that I committed to a song, I will keep Superior Drama open just for the uh, case of doing it, because maybe I need to decide something else in the mix. But now um, I'm going to start to rebalance the mix um, for the final time before I actually start the mix. Yes. 
and everyone is blind I don't mind I'll be sure to end it soon Is everybody fine? Don't you So guys, that was pretty much it. Um, now I'm pretty happy with the overall balance. Um, the next step would be that I build my own template and that I use my template, uh, which I always use and start like the first routing, bust the drums together, the guitars, the bass probably, the vocals, and really actually starting to mix that song. If you want to know more about the song or how I mixed it, just let me know. That was my two-part series of my um, Superior Drama 3 mixing workflow. If you have any questions regarding this topic, comments, leave a comment below. Consider to subscribe, of course. Thanks ever so much for watching, guys, and see you next time. Bye-bye.